Laura. Hello and welcome to In Conversation and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Laura Helmuth and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American and today we'll be speaking with David Biello who is the science curator for TED conferences and a former uh, staffer for Scientific American. So uh, it's, it's a delight to have him back with us at Springer Nature for the day. Uh, David, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for coming. And um, yeah, do you want to uh, to start, I guess, by telling us a little bit about like what your job is at TED? Science Curator is such a fun title. It really is a fun title, and I like to describe it as uh, a three-part job, the first of which actually Curator covers. That's finding uh, great scientists with great ideas uh, who have uh, the opportunity to give a great uh, TED Talk. Um, then I transition into sort of speech writer mode or speech editor mode, uh, helping them give the best possible version of that idea and that talk. Um, and then last but not least, uh, what I would describe as therapist, because it turns out people don't usually go into science because uh, they want to stand on a stage in a little red circle and give a <laughs> TED talk. And I get a little nervous. It's, I, I know it's kind of shocking, but uh, it's true. So those are the three parts of my job. That's great. Well, I, know, I imagine most of the people who are joining us for this conversation have, have seen a TED Talk and they look so smooth. Uh, you know, you would never know that anybody has stage fright or is intimidated by like literally having a spotlight on them and being up on stage and in front of God in the world. Um, so you do a great job and, and they, they, you know, they're, they're really fun. And I, you know, I imagine that the format you know, has evolved a, a bit over the years. Are there any like lessons of, you know, how, well, how long have you been there and have you kind of noticed some things that make a talk successful or, you know, kind of new patterns you're uncovering about like how science communication works in this format? Yeah. Uh, so I joined uh, TED from Scientific American mm -hmm. uh, in 2016. Uh, so about six years ago at this point. And uh, yeah, I would say I've learned a lot of lessons, the most important of which is the key to an excellent TED Talk, it actually doesn't matter what the subject is, is that your passion for the subject shows through. Nice. Uh, so if you're up there and uh, you're talking about, I don't know, electrochemistry uh, or, or climate change, things that can be very kind of abstract and, and, and sometimes, frankly, boring, if your passion for it shows through, the, the audience will, will kind of go along on that ride with you, even if it's a very kind of dense uh, and scientific uh, talk, because they're just entranced by the passion that you demonstrate uh, for the project. Um, and so that goes to, I guess, my uh, key point about, uh, about uh, science communication, which is um, in distinction to kind of how we're trained and how we feel, it's it's not so much the facts that matter as the as the emotions. Um, that's yeah. what you're trying to to get to, you're trying to get to people's hearts yeah. if you want to change minds. And that's really hard for scientists to do, uh, and science journalists to do because we're sort of trained to really uh, believe in the facts and and uh, uh, to think that facts are very persuasive. Um, but for uh, the majority of people, um, that's just not the case. There's actually facts to prove that. It's just yeah. <laughs> uh, research to prove that. It's just really hard to let go of that kind of fact and logic-based worldview. I know that because, yeah. you know, I'm certainly one of those folks, but it's it's not the best way to reach people. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And at a meta level, you know, that is the evidence shows that the evidence doesn't always work or often doesn't work or doesn't work as well as other things. And um yeah, it's, you know, that's hard. And there's also, you know, I think that that's one problem. There's kind of a persistent deficit model um, is what it's called in the research literature, that if you would just provide people, you know, right. knowledge, then they would make good decisions and understand the world better. And um, yeah, I mean, they, obviously, you know, the, the knowledge needs to be there, the explanations need to be there, but it's not enough to just say this yeah. is how this works. This is what the data shows. I think that's been my entire career in, in covering climate change. Uh, certainly for the first uh, decade or so of that, I was uh, uh, a proponent of the information deficit uh, mm -hmm. model, right? I thought, oh, okay, if I just prove to people that climate change is real through facts and figures and all the rest of it, well, then obviously we're going to do something about it. Yeah. 
Um, and uh, that has not proven to be the case. And so we, we go back and, and we wonder why. And if you look at the, the research, like you're saying, it's because we weren't reaching people uh, kind of where they actually live. We were bombarding them with facts and figures. Um, and that was not what was going to um, uh, change their minds or, or change their uh, actions. We needed to um, talk about their real lived experience in a climate changed uh, world. And uh, that's not what, certainly not what I was doing early in my career and, and not what a lot of people are, are still doing because it is so hard to let go of that information deficit model since we, since I love facts. I love little, <laughs> yeah. little you know. <laughs> and we, of course, are completely logical and follow the evidence wherever it leads. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's uh -huh. right. <laughs> There's a lot of good reasons for people who are experts to share their expertise uh, with the public, but I think in you know which which is a gift, obviously, to um, the people who are reading or you know consuming, listening to, watching the content, enjoying the TED talk. But it, it seems to be also the case that a lot of people, when they do it, they kind of understand their own work in a better way, or like kind of rekindle that passion. Like, we, what, why am I doing? Why am I committing my whole career <laughs> to this subject? Why does it really matter? And when you can. Um, kind of recapture that and share it with the world, I think it can be energizing for the people who are doing the communication also. I completely agree. And I think the, uh, I guess, dark flip side of the, the coin that we're talking about is that uh, I often run into scientists uh, who are so disheartened by the, the failure of the information deficit model that they're like, well, I don't need to publicly communicate. You know, it's not, uh, there's nothing I can do. Um, yeah. And that is just absolutely false. Um, there's nothing more important you can do uh, than communicate your science to the public, whether it's funding you care about, because guess what, uh, at least in the US and in many parts of the world, it's uh, public funding that's uh, driving science forward. So you better get the public uh, <laughs> yeah. on your side if you want that, uh, if you want that money, but also just in terms of, I don't know, climate change, public health, whatever the scientific topic you may be working on. Um, it is the public uh, that is ultimately going to decide um, these issues. And so giving them um, the information that they need, as well as the motivation um, uh, to make these changes uh, is, is one of the more important things that, uh, that scientists can do. And, and I think too often that gets lost in the uh, uh, rush for the next grant or uh, you know, the focus on the peer group. Uh, or the, the focus on the uh, prestige publication or whatever it might be. Yeah, they're busy. <laughs> yeah, we're all busy. I understand yeah. it's not uh, not their primary job. Yeah. And so, you know, climate change, you've been covering climate change, trying to help people comprehend it and make good decisions and insist on good policies for a while. Um, and, you know, for the past two something years, two and a half years now, we've been living through you know, the worst pandemic in living memory. Um, and, you know, I imagine you've seen some parallels in the in the communication challenges, um, and, you know, with, with climate change. Obviously, we're, we're, you know, we're literally all in this together. We're all in this planet together. And you know, with the pandemic, it's the same way. You know, it's communicating good information like protects everybody. Like, bad information is literally deadly. Um, yeah. Do, have you? Yeah, I did, we didn't pre-select these questions, so if, if you don't have an answer, that's fine. But do you have any any observations about how climate communication can learn from pandemic communication and vice versa? Simplicity and clarity are key. Yeah. Um, uh, I think one of the uh, fatal flaws of pandemic communication so far is that there have been so many confusing mixed uh, messages so that people don't know. Well, should I wear a mask or shouldn't I? Uh, you know, what what is in the vaccines? All these uh, kind of um, doubts can take root when there isn't kind of simple, clear, consistent messaging. Um, and to contradict that a little bit, the other key is communicating uncertainty. Yeah. Um, uh, that has also been sort of a, a fatal flaw for both climate change and uh, this uh, uh, pandemic communication. You know, what what do we know with uh, with certainty and what are we this is our best guess at this time because we're learning in real time. Uh, that's how science works. Uh, you know, you're constantly uh, approaching the truth uh, and refining uh, uh, your understanding of it, but it's not it's never a finished process. 
Uh, and so communicating that uncertainty um, uh, around, uh, let's say, early in the pandemic, how the virus was spreading, uh, what were the most dangerous uh, places for you um, uh, to, to get exposure. Science is learning in, uh, in real time. Uh, and so uh, uh, you just kind of have to go, you have to communicate that uh, accurately when, when you're talking about these things. And it's been the same uh, with climate change, although with climate change, there's a lot more uh, certainty. Uh, we know that fossil fuel burning leads to CO2, and we know that CO2 traps heat. I mean, those are uh, fundamentals of physics. We've known those uh, for centuries. Um, where the uncertainty comes in is us. What, what are people going to do in response to those facts? Are we going to reduce our burning of fossil fuels or not? Um, that's where the uncertainty comes in there. Yeah, one of the um, one of the kind of formulas we've been using to to get around uncertainty or to to help people comprehend the uncertainty is um, we have a headline structure that's you know subject subject you know you know what are the long term consequences of COVID here's what we know so far is COVID airborne here's what we know so far um, here's what we know about X Y and Z and it's it, it seems like a really good way to let people know okay we're going to tell you everything that's known about this. Here's what isn't known. Here's who's looking for it, and we'll let you know when we know more. Um, and I think you know because if people have a question, they want it to be answered. And sometimes the best answer is we don't know the answer yet. And so making that explicit: here's what we don't know. Here's what we do know. Here's what we don't know. And then that kind of prevents people from going down you know conspiracy theory rabbit holes to to get an answer, even though it's wrong because it's unsatisfying to not have an answer. But it helps to know there isn't one yet. But there will be. We hope there will be. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. Um, and one of the interesting things about covering climate change in, in, the, in terms of disinformation is I feel like in some ways uh, um, climate change and, and the way it's been um, treated in the world is a, a prelude to everything we've been experiencing in this uh, new century. I don't know if uh, you remember Climate Gate, yeah. um, but that was a, a, you know, a hacking uh, into some climate scientists' uh, emails and, and sharing those with the world. It was a real disinformation uh, right. campaign, an early precursor uh, to kind of undermine um, uh, the global climate negotiations and cast yeah. doubt uh, on, uh, on climate science and climate scientists, like yeah. are these trustworthy uh, people? Um, and we saw how uh, certain words were manipulated and it was really a kind of a trial run mm -hmm. uh, for many of the things that we've seen play out in, in so many different arenas, whether it's uh, politics or the pandemic uh, since. So uh, covering climate change in a way has, for me, been a good inoculation <laughs> against uh, against its information, because in that space, uh, we've been dealing with it for so long. Yeah. yeah. And the anti-vaxxers and the anti-maskers, they use, you know, it's the same tactics that, that fossil fuel and tobacco use to cast out, exactly. to, you know, doubt the messenger, weaponize uncertainty, all that stuff. Exactly. So um, to, you know, we could... <laughs> We could go on all day about what's, you know, the problems with communication. Do you, do you perceive, I, I, I think, I hope that during the pandemic, people have kind of expanded their understanding of science. Do you perceive that there's kind of a, a larger audience now for people who, you know, once you understand something, you, you kind of find it more interesting. And uh, I wonder if we're going to see that in people who are interested in, in knowing more about science in general? I think uh, we're all epidemiologists <laughs> now, uh, right? Uh, or at least amateur ones. And uh, uh, second of all, we all know what epidemiology no, is. Yeah. And I don't think that was true uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and it is my experience that uh, folks um, are finding more interest in science because it's becoming more and more clear how much this information um, uh, is determining uh, the backdrop of our lives, whether it's uh, you know climate change and, and and new climates and wildfires and and all the natural, well unnatural disasters that uh, uh, are occurring all around the world. Uh, you know whether it's heat extremes or or other uh, you know extreme weather, um, it's real and people are are feeling the effects. Uh, and and uh, as a result, there's a lot more interest in it. And this is also true for the pandemic. And it's sort of like a gateway uh, uh, to a deeper engagement with, uh, with science as you start to understand, okay, well, what can I do 
uh, about climate change. Oh, gosh, uh, I should learn some chemistry so I can work on better batteries or, or whatever it might be. Um, and I have seen people go down those, let's say, positive uh, rabbit holes or, you know, gosh, we're in a we're in this terrible pandemic. What can I do uh, to help accelerate, uh, you know, vaccine, new vaccine development, uh, whether it's, you know, the nasal sprays that are uh, potentially coming or um, uh, what I'm excited about, I guess, the multi, if, if they can pull it off, the multiplex oh, vaccines yeah. where in one shot uh, you could get some protection against COVID, the flu and some of the other respiratory viruses that are out there. That's exciting stuff. And, and, and my experience as TED Science Curator is that people get excited about that. And again, that's one part, the passion of the person sharing uh, the idea. But the other half of it is sort of the exciting nature of the science itself. Um, and I think that's why scientists get into science yeah, in the first that's right. place, right? And hopefully pass along that passion and encourage, encourage kids to, to go into it. And David and I, you know, we we go back. We uh, David had a had a great book, <laughs> The Unnatural World: The Race to Remake Civilization in Earth's Newest Age. And and that book was, um, you know, had a lot of hope for uh, people, innovations, um, approaches that could kind of reckon with the the climate crisis, the climate emergency. And so I was wondering if you know, in the meantime, so in the past six years, what are some things that mm -hmm. give you hope now? about the climate crisis? I think the, the thing that gives me the most hope about the climate crisis, uh, and this is, will not come as a surprise to you, is uh, the number of people um, that are now engaged uh, as a result of, of, of seeing climate change at work in the world around them, at seeing uh, the systemic nature of the problem, whether it's the fossil fuel industry uh, you know, trying to uh, delay action, okay, predatory delay, as it's called. Um, uh, and that's gotten us uh, where we are. It, it is, um, I wish we had gotten here a little sooner. Uh, and I guess that's the, uh, um, uh, the crisis side of it. But uh, we're getting there. And uh, that gives me uh, a huge amount of hope. And that book was really about kind of the unreasonably optimistic folks who are trying to do something about, about climate change, this vast global problem. Uh, um, and there are more and more of those kinds of folks out there. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I want yeah. us all to be there. And we want to hear their stories and hear stories about them. People yeah. who actually know what they're talking about should talk about what they know. And, um, you know, of course, I would like you know, people watching this who are interested, who think they have a story idea or would like to write for Scientific American, get in touch with me, get in touch with any of our editors. Um, what's, you know, is there a good route to, to do a TED Talk? Like how, um, how do they start on that journey? Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. I would encourage everyone uh, who's excited about giving a TED Talk to, to, to try to give one. Um, and we have a space on our website where you can kind of self-nominate. I encourage you to, to use it. Uh, and let's, let's be frank. I am one guy. I'm the science curator. And I am covering all of science. That's astronomy to zoology, right? Uh, all of the sciences uh, all around the world. So not just the U.S. Uh, and Europe uh, and Japan and uh, uh, China and, you know, everywhere. Because uh, there's good science going on everywhere around the world, um, and it's not so easy to find it. So I need you uh, to step forward and say, hey, I want to communicate about what's going on with uh, climate change in Nigeria. Um, uh, I, I want to know about that. I personally want to know about that. So please, uh, uh, you know, help me find you. Yeah. And, and I, so yes, yeah, self-nomination, of course, for all kinds of cultural reasons, there are biases and who self-nominates and who doesn't. Um, so if you're of listening course. to this and you think, oh, I'm not good enough to give a Ted talk, you are. <laughs> yeah. Put, your, put yourself out there. It is so important uh, to communicate uh, what is going on in science all around the world um, so that people can also understand that science is not undertaken by some, um, I don't know, alien uh, race that is uh, super elite and removed from the, the course of normal humanity. I'm, I'm sorry to break it to you scientists, that's not who you are. You're just regular human beings uh, and you need to share what you know with uh, the other regular human beings out there. And I think you'll be surprised at how far that uh, mm -hmm. that gets you.
Yeah, no, that's great advice. And yeah, that's, that's, I, mean, I feel like so much of what we do is trying to humanize and demystify science and show that it is, you know, just the, the, the best we can do with what we've got and, uh, and, and to make it more welcoming and inclusive and, and make everybody feel like science can be part of their lives, their, you know, their decision making, their voting, um, their, you know, families' careers potentially. So, um, yeah, and I, and I think certainly TED Talks are an inspiring way for people to, 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 to get that sense that, oh, this is, this is really exciting. This is for me too. Well, thank you so much for, for talking with me today. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, you know, stay in touch. Good luck out there. Um, give it a shot. Communication is, is exhilarating. It's fun. Uh, sometimes it goes wrong. That'll happen. Um, you learn from your mistakes. Try again. And we hope to, hope to hear from you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.